Thank you so much, Luigi. I'm very happy to be here today. And my talk is entitled Human Dignity as the Foundation of Human Rights. And in the next 30, maybe 40 minutes, I will try to make sense of that claim as much as I can. And this is what I will do more specifically. So I will first uh, explain my central questions, thesis, and presuppositions. Then I will explain how I think human dignity should be interpreted in the human rights context, namely as a universal moral status. I will explain what I mean by that, obviously. Um, then I will argue that this is actually a Kantian approach to human dignity. So we find the main elements uh, of this specific interpretation of human dignity in Kant, which is not undisputed. Um, and I will then very briefly outline the implications of this interpretation for the claim that human dignity is the foundation of human rights. Now, first, why human dignity? Why should we not focus on some other foundation of human rights? Now, as you will probably know, um, the claim that human dignity is the foundation of human rights is on the one hand very prominent, but it is also very disputed. So there is a lot of critique of the, context, uh, of the concept of human dignity in this context. It has been claimed um, that it is useless, that it is redundant, uh, that it is Western, or maybe that we don't need a foundation of human rights at all, or simply that there are better candidates like autonomy, agency, personhood. Okay, so why, why human dignity? I think there are actually very good reasons to focus on human dignity, and these are three of them. The first reason is that I think human rights without a foundation are neither coherently thinkable nor practicably. So we need a reason, in short, why there should be human rights at all and what specific rights qualify as human rights. And whatever justifies these claims is their foundation. And without such a foundation, we cannot arrive at a coherent conception of human rights. I will say more about my understanding of a foundation in a minute. So that's the first reason, but that's of course not a reason for human dignity. That's only a reason for why we need a foundation. One specific reason for why we should think about human dignity is the prominence of the concept of human dignity, especially in law. And here are just some very well-known examples. A quote from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the preamble. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, and so on. So here, human dignity is not specifically mentioned as a foundation of human rights, but there is a close conceptual relationship being maintained between human dignity and human rights. So in some sense, one doesn't go without the other, but it's not stated in what sense exactly. And then more straightforward are the examples from the, um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, where uh, in both cases, cases it states recognizing that these rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. So here, for instance, human dignity is explicitly mentioned as a ground or foundation of these rights. So, and of course, this doesn't have to be right but we should at least try to make sense of these claims, given that they are stated in very important documents. And then a third reason is that, or so I would claim, human dignity has a specific connotation as a moral status. And this is something that alternative concepts, concepts that one might think are very close to human dignity, like for instance, personhood, agency, and autonomy, they do not have this specific connotation. So I think this is something special about human dignity, but we can talk about that later. So in short, human dignity is a need for interpretation. We should ask what could be a meaningful interpretation of human dignity in the human rights context and should at least try to make sense of it as much as possible. And that's what I will do. So now first, something about my conceptual presuppositions. So as you probably also know, there is a long history of thinking about human dignity. There is a variety of concepts of human dignity. A Ciceronian con uh, concept, a descriptive concept, a normative concept, and so on. And a variety of usages, moral, legal, and so on. Um, and here I'm only interested in a modern 
normative concept of human dignity, which has the following features. It is universal, so by hypothesis at least, all human beings have human dignity. Human beings have human dignity equally, and human dignity is categorical, so in the sense that normative considerations that somehow follow from human dignity are overriding with regard to other action guiding considerations. And it's rights related. So very roughly, if someone has dignity, then he or she also has rights in some sense. Um, so I'm focusing on this concept, obviously, because only this concept is a candidate for grounding human rights. And when I hear speak of human dignity, I'm always talking about in this sense. Then there are also different concepts of human rights, where it's important to distinguish them. In particular, it's very important to distinguish between human rights as a specific kind of moral rights and human rights as a specific kind of legal rights. Um, legal rights are, their legal dimension is very important, but I will entirely bracket it here. So I'm only speak, speaking about human rights in a moral sense, which are by definition the rights that every human being has simply in virtue of being human. Okay, then I, my talk is also, or my argument is also based on a very important meta-ethical presupposition, and I will simply presuppose it here, I will not argue for it, which is, in short, that moral realism is not an option. So I assume that practical principles are not given, or factual, or quasi-natural, and the same holds for their ground. So there simply is nothing like that. When we talk about morality, what we have at hand, roughly, is our practical reason, reason giving, arguments, and so on. But we cannot draw on some mind independent objective facts. There simply isn't something like that. So that's like in a nutshell now, obviously, but I will presuppose that. So if we want to say something about human dignity and human rights, we need to draw on our practical self understanding, on our self understanding as agents or as beings who at least sometimes act morally. And we have to. Uh, to, um, to draw on self-reflexive justification. I will say more about that shortly. And I understand the concept of a foundation accordingly. So that's not like some metaphysical entity or some normative fact or it doesn't have to do anything with ultimate foundations. Uh, it is simply a ground or a justifying reason. So whatever justifies that we have, that human beings have human rights, that is their ground or foundation. That's how I use the concept. Okay, and finally here are my two main theses. First, the modern moral concept of human dignity should be interpreted as a moral status rather than as an absolute value. And secondly, we find the main elements of this understanding of human dignity in Kant's practical philosophy. Now, how should we interpret human dignity? When we say human beings have human dignity, what does that mean? In the literature on human dignity, we find very broadly two different answers to this question. One is a so-called value conception of human dignity, and the other one is a so-called status conception of human dignity. And I want to send one clarificatory note ahead. So I'm presenting these two views here as clear cut, as if it were always clear, okay, this is a value conception, this is a status conception. This is actually not so. So as a matter of fact, it's often very difficult to draw the line and to decide uh, what actually qualifies one of the two accounts. And they are also more complex. So for instance, uh, there are other ways to understand the concept of a value as I presented here. So this is simplified. Okay on a value concept or conception of human dignity. Human dignity is something that human beings have. So it is a value property that somehow inheres in human nature. Um, so the basic idea is human dignity is not something that we earn or acquire, but something that we have. So it must be some mind independent fact that somehow like lies in our nature. That's the basic idea. Um, and such a conception of human dignity often uh, comes along with a moral realist account and eventually an intuitionist methodology. So to show that we have human dignity in this sense, 
would require the proof of the existence of a specific normative fact. Now, once again, this is a value realist account broadly understood. There are, for instance, value constructivist accounts that would say that would like sound completely different. But that's how I understand or how, how I introduce it here. <coughs> now, this is not convincing for me uh, because I reject moral realism. <coughs> An alternative conception is a so-called status concept or conception of human dignity, which would state human dignity is something that all human beings morally ought to attribute to one another. So there's a moral ought at stake here that needs to be justified, namely a certain moral status. And how do we justify that? Well, by a self-reflexive method. So we have to show that this moral principle that all human beings morally ought to attribute this status to one another is sound. This requires a justification that can itself not draw on some normative fact. Now, the first view, this value concept of human dignity, just because I will talk about Kant in a minute, is something that has for a long time been attributed to Kant. Like, this happened last time as well. Yes, it's yes. very weird. Uh, it will stop again. Uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, that it has been attributed to Kant, so roughly the view, because human beings have, for instance, rationality, they also have human dignity, and because of that, they ought to respect one another. Uh, this view has been challenged in the last year. I will talk about that later. But, uh, okay, so that's just to give you an idea of what I'm arguing for. So this value conception of human dignity has been attributed to Kant, um, not by everyone, of course. And I would argue, by contrast, or will argue, that it is precisely the status concept of human dignity that we can find in Kant's work. Okay, now, on this status concept of human dignity, we would say, and I would just read this out, human beings have human dignity means, this is like a loose way of speaking, we don't actually have something, but it means human beings morally ought to respect one another in a particular way, namely, they ought to attribute the moral status of human dignity to one another, which means the same as they ought to respect one another as subjects of moral concerns, and what does that mean, of moral concern, and what does that mean? We ought to respect one another as holders of human rights. So that's in a nutshell how I would say what a status concept of human dignity means. Now, and this, before I move to Kant, so I would say that, okay, a status, when we speak of human dignity of a status, this is not something that grounds the moral principle to respect one another, but it's actually the core of that very principle. So we can likewise speak of a principle of human dignity, which is just the same as a principle of respect for person or a principle of human rights. So it doesn't matter how we call it, it really comes down to the same. And it simply states every human being morally ought to respect every other human being as having moral rights at all. So as being a bearer of moral rights. That's essentially what human dignity means which implies that human dignity as a moral principle and human dignity um, as a moral status are just two sides of the same coin. So there's a moral principle, a highest moral principle actually, to attribute the status of human dignity to one another, and we only have this status in so far as we ought to attribute it to one another. So it's all captured in an ought. Okay, now, how does Kant help us to further like understand this view. Now I want to send a note ahead so that there won't be misunderstandings. So there have been a lot of debates in the last years about the role and meaning of human dignity and human rights in Kant's work. So of course human dignity and human rights are two different things, uh, but they are also related. Um, and I only want to, want to mention a couple of points. So first it has been argued that Kant does not use the term human dignity in a modern sense. So the view that I just outlined, human dignity is a value property that inheres in human beings and that grounds normative obligations to respect them. It has been argued that this view has been wrongly attributed to Kant. That's actually not how he uses the term. He uses that in a sense of a traditional Ciceronian paradigm. So Oliver Sensen is the one who has made this view famous. Um, that's one point. Then 
it is very much disputed whether Kant actually advocated human rights or uh, whether we find any like elements of a theory of human rights in his work. So there's, uh, one might hold that there's a lack of textual basis for this assumption. And then finally, so the first two points, by the way, I find like very, the f very convincing. So I would also say that this is very dubitable. And this is how we would like interpret elements of Kant's work. The third point is not about uh, text interpretation anymore, but about a systematic development of a theory starting from Kant's work. And here, people like, for instance, Andrea San Giovanni famously have argued that there can be no Kantian theory of human rights, and others would say there can also not be a Kantian theory of human dignity. And here I would disagree. I would disagree that this is like possible, but that's a different story that I, I, I cannot fully justify this here. All I want to make clear is that, so when I speak about human dignity in Kant, I'm not speaking about how he uses the term dignity, but I'm speaking about a concept of human dignity in Kant. So if we presuppose that human dignity should be understood as a status, can we find such an idea in Kant? And can we like systematically develop further this idea starting from his philosophy? Okay, now, I would say that the core of a Kantian conception of human dignity is the so-called humanity formula of the categorical imperative. Um, and more precisely, the meaning of this formula, its systematic place in Kant's practical philosophy, and its justification, its self-reflexive justification. So, as a reminder, here's the humanity formula. Um, so act that you use humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. That's from the groundwork. I assume that you are all acquainted with that. Now, there are four points about this formula that I want to emphasize. The first you probably know, so humanity in this formula does not actually mean uh, the collective of humans, all human beings, but it means pure practical reason. That is very clear from other passages in Kant's work. So that's what's really meant by humanity here. Um, then a second point, so this humanity formula is the highest moral principle. As you might recall, in the groundwork, Kant develops um, the categorical imperative and then develops several formulas of this imperative, which, however, are equivalent. So this is not like some derivation of the categorical imperative. It's the categorical imperative, the highest moral principle in one specific formulation. So there is, in a way, like, not, not in a way, so there is no higher moral principle in Kant's work. <coughs> Thirdly, highest here means fundamental. And, okay, this might sound like an odd claim to you, because whether we call something the highest moral principle or fundamental moral principle actually means precisely the same. What I want to stress with this is that the categorical imperative or the humanity formula of the categorical imperative are not the highest moral principle in the sense that it's like one norm that trumps all other norm, but it's in the, way, in the way the basis of all other norms in the sense that if there is no categorical imperative, then there is no morality at all. So it's the presupposition of thinking about and formulating any more specific moral claims. It's fundamental in that sense. And of course, that's important because if human dignity is the ground of human rights, then it would be fundamental in a similar sense. That's why I point this out. And finally, um, the humanity formula or the categorical imperative is grounded in a self-reflexive movement of thought. So there's not some like value, according to Kant, uh, that grounds the categorical imperative, but uh, morality starts, as it were, with the categorical imperative, which is itself grounded um, in a self-reflexive method. Like, now, okay, what does such a self-reflexive method imply? And I will just like explain this in a very simplified version. But yeah, uh, I mean, we can talk about it more, but I thought I shouldn't like make it too complex at this point. Uh, what does the self-reflexive justification of the humanity formula imply? So you can think of it like this. You start to build such an argument, and there are two premises in Kant. The first is an 
ethical premise. Namely that if there are moral principles at all, then they have to be universal and necessary. Universal means they have to be valid for every human being or actually for every rational person, for every agent. Um, so of course rationality is central here. They have to be valid for every rational agent or in the judgment of every rational agent. And they have to be necessary. So whether they are valid or not cannot depend on just contingent individual preferences. They have to be like valid for all rational agents under all circumstances. Otherwise, it's, not, it's really not a moral principle, according to Kant. The second premise is um, a psychological or action theoretical premise, namely that every human action implies to set oneself an end. That's simply what we do when we act. We set ourselves an end. For instance, I don't know, I go for a run for some reason um, that I judge to be important for me. So, okay. And now, okay, now the crucial question is, if we want to justify a moral principle, then we have to find something that is valid for all rational agents, even though they all have different individual subjective ends. And what could this be? This is like the basic question. Now, I pursue an end because I judge that it is good for me. This means, for instance, if I go for a run, then maybe I want to have more energy, maybe I want to stay healthy or whatever. So there is a reason for me individually why I choose this end or this course of action. And this is so good does not mean morally good here. It simply means it is good for me in some sense. But of course, human beings pursue all kinds of ends. So how do we get from there to a moral principle? Well, what all human actions have in common is that they involve end setting. So we are all agents and we all pursue ends. If we leave all individual ends aside, that's really what's left. Which leads Kant to the conclusion, and obviously I'm leaving many important steps out here because then the argument would be far more complicated, which leads, leads Kant to the conclusion that agency or practical reason must be an end for itself. And that's exactly what the humanity formula states. This is the gist of the formula. Every human being ought to respect every other human being, or actually rational agent, in accordance with his or her status of having practical reason or of being an agent. So <coughs> this is the essence of that formula, at least how I would understand it. OK. Um, which would exactly be like, like be equivalent to what I called the principle of human dignity earlier. Now there's one problem. This is a moral obligation. Um, what like Kant's philosophy centers about moral obligations, about the categorical imperative, and so on. And an obligation is something different from a right. But one, what we want to end up with, in a way, is an argument for why we should not only recognize each other as agents, but why every one of us has a right to be recognized in that way. And we can't find that in Kant. Kant is not, Kant's philosophy is not right-centered. So I think in this sense, we need to, uh, to take a step out of Kant's philosophy in order to arrive uh, from here at a theory of human rights. And now it's getting admittedly a bit abstract because I didn't want to introduce yet another argument. But there is a guy, you might have heard of him, his name is Alan Gilworth. Um, and he is essentially like taken a Kantian method of justification and from there built a theory of human rights. Um, this is very fascinating stuff, it's also very complicated. And to outline his argument here in detail would just like lead us too far. So I'm just very briefly summarizing like what would be the last step in this argument. So what Geworth is doing essentially is he is trying to spell out what is necessarily implied in our self-understanding as agents. So our, like in my self, in my practical self-understanding as an agent, in your practical self-understanding and so on. So provided that we self are agents, when we start to reflect on our agency and we pull out the implications, 
then we arrive at human rights. So I know this is abstract, but okay. Um, okay, and the conclu conclusion that he reaches is that, that's the first point, nobody can consistently deny that every human being has a moral right to the generic conditions of his or her agency. So I must think that in order to be an agent, I need certain things. And at the highest level, Geworth says, that's freedom and well-being. I need certain things, otherwise I can't be an agent. And I have to recognize, and he shows that with a very sophisticated argument, I have to recognize that I have to um, regard myself as having a moral claim right to the generic conditions of my agency, but I also have to recognize that everyone else has a moral claim right to the generic, generic conditions of his or her agency. And he starts that with like precisely a Kantian method of reflecting ourselves as being with practical reason or beings, uh, being things that are also agents. Okay, so this would lead us to an idea of um, human rights to freedom and well-being as like being the very basic, most general human rights from where we can then um, develop like more specific human rights. And Geworth also argues that this gives us a criterion for specifying and weighing human rights claims in concrete practical contexts, namely um, the degree of certain rights for the necessity of agency. So some things are basic for us to be agents. So for instance, I need food, uh, I need to be psychologically healthy and so on. And then there are other things that are maybe not so important, that I own a villa, that I have, I don't know, a cupboard full of clothes or stuff like that. Okay, now, these are the conclusions. Human dignity is a moral status that all human beings morally ought to attribute to one another. This moral status is the status of having moral human rights. To respect human dignity means to respect the fundamental moral right of every human being to the necessary conditions of his or her agency and everything that follows from this right. Human dignity is grounded in the necessary practical self-understanding of human agents. Now, what does it mean that human dignity is the foundation of human rights on this interpretation? It does not mean that human dignity is an inherent value property from which a list of human rights can be derived, but it means that human dignity is the core of a human rights principle, um, which states that we are the holders of moral rights at all. And it is also the basis for justifying and concretizing further human rights claims. Thank you for your attention.